So thank you very much for coming, despite the weather. I'd like to welcome you. It's a, this is the first talk in the new series of economics beyond the Swabian Hausfrau. I don't know if any of you picked up on the first series. I, we, it was um, really very, very good, and I think this next series is also excellent. We have tonight Nick Jackson, as you well know, on the 23rd of October. In this room at 7 o'clock is Daniela Gabo, who many of you may not know, but a very special economist uh, who all of us are very fond of and very much admire. On the 12th of November, Grace Blakely is coming. That's going to be in the Monarch Bar. That's an Tor. Lovely location for talks. Then on the, when is that? the 28th of November, Jason Hickel is coming. I don't know if any of you know his book, The Divide. But he's very prominent right now in degrowth. So he'll be here. And then, and this is always a very difficult one, on Tuesday, the 1st of October, uh, no, that's today, the 29th of October, we have Kostas Hatsimikalis, I hope I pronounced it correctly, he's Greek. And what we've been trying to do is get some Southern Europeans to come and present their view of the Euro crisis. But um, it's been a bit odd. No Germans come. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe they've um, they've just accepted you know the the current explanation. The problem that Southern Europeans have is they spend all their money on alcohol and women, and there's no economics involved in the question. Anyway, it should be a very interesting evening once again. So you're quite welcome. There's I think everyone has a flyer on their seat. Otherwise, we keep introductions very short, and that's it. We'll just turn this over to Nick, and you'll take your own questions afterwards. Right? Yep. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so I am going to talk about... It's, it's my book, but it's, it's kind of a concept that I've been developing with somebody else that I'll get to in the presentation. Um, I'm a journalist by background. Um, I'm a kind of amateur economist, a political economist. Um, but my background really started in 19, the sort of early 90s in, in Angola. And you see this book, Poison. Oh, sorry, um, we haven't got there yet. But um, uh, my first book was about oil and politics in West Africa and uh, how all this money that was coming into these places didn't seem to be making these. Um, countries richer and in, in some cases in fact in Angola where I lived uh, it seemed to be making the country even poorer um, and more, more corrupt and more conflicted. Treasure Islands was my second book um, which is about tax havens now ta tax havens the sort of essence of a tax haven from my perspective um, who is very critical of tax havens is that they transmit harm out to other countries and the finance curse is a kind of logical progression from that because the finance curse, the essence of the finance curse is that countries with oversized financial centers, um, and I stress that word oversized, transmit harm inwards to the country that hosts them. So in Britain, my country, uh, we have a massive financial center that is harming our country in many ways. But you could also make the same arguments for countries like the United States, uh, Ireland, and many others. Small tax havens as well. So I started out, yes, in the early 90s, I was the Reuters and Financial Times <coughs> correspondent in Angola. And uh, that was a country um, that was producing a lot of oil, and it was at war. And uh, the, I think it producing like one and a half million barrels of oil a day. And it was one of the bigger suppliers of oil to the United States. Um, but people were always asking, how come this place with so much, apparently so much money, um, is so poor? And I never really had an answer. But as I was living and working there in the early 90s, some academics 
uh, mostly in the United States, were starting to put together this kind of thesis called the resource curse. And the resource curse really applies to countries that are dominated by oil. Not all countries are afflicted by the resource curse that are dominated by oil, but many are. So, um, you know, Angola, Venezuela, countries like that, um, uh, usually poorer countries that produce a lot of oil, they tend to cause, um, you know, the oil tends to cause a lot of trouble. The weak, it's not just that the money's being stolen, though there's, of course, plenty of that. It's not just that there's corruption and the money's disappearing. Um, it seems to be worse than that in many cases. And certainly in Angola, when I was living there, um, nobody was any doubt that this country was worse off than, than um, if it hadn't had the oil and the diamonds. Um, and the, the Angolan war was about many things, but um, the oil and the diamonds fed the war, not just in terms of providing the money for the weapons, but also creating all sorts of political dynamics that were keeping the war going. When I was living there, according to the IMF, 99.5% of Angolan exports were either oil or diamonds. Um, and I looked at the IMF, same IMF data recently, and the figure is exactly the same. It is still, uh, now 17 years after the war ended, still it is not producing anything else. Um, so this country, despite 17 years of peace and um, an enormous amount of money, $400 billion um, worth of oil produced since then, hasn't seemed to have developed itself. So it, there's a kind of paradox going on here, that, and they call it, it's another name for the resource curse. This is a famous book by Terry Lynn Carl, The Paradox of Plenty. So. Um, all this money seems to be making these, these countries poorer. It's not the case with every country. Um, uh, Norway is an obvious exception. It produces a lot of oil and has done pretty well. Um, but it tends to be countries that already have good, strong institutions that are able to withstand these kind of pressures. But this paradox, more money makes you poorer, is at the heart of the resource curse. So that's kind of where I was coming, well, you know, that was my introduction to this from the 1990s, and I continued living in and writing about these countries um, for, an, for about 15 years. West Africa, I sort of looked at the West African oil producing countries. And by the way, anybody who needs to ask a question or heckle or anything, please feel free um, in the middle of my talk. I'm, uh, I'm going to witcher on for a long time, and I think I might, in the middle, because I've got quite a bit to say, I might in the middle have some questions, and then just to kind of have a break, and then uh, we can carry on. So, what was the cause of the resource curse? Well, the academics that put this, this idea together, and I very much um, agree with their analysis, having you know, lived in Angola, um, there are some classic reasons why oil seems to have been so damaging to some countries that produce it. Um, one is this brain drain. In other words, you have this one dominant sector and all the kind of best qualified, best educated, most talented people in the country get sucked out of every other sector, out of manufacturing, out of, whoops, sorry, um, sucked out of civil society, sucked out of government into this highly paid sector and um, they're kind of damaging all the other sectors. Um, oil um, Dependent economies have these massive, you know, when oil prices go up, they, you know, they went up to $150 a barrel, down to $10 a barrel. And when you've got a country that's, you know, over 99% of its exports is, is this, um, are these minerals, that creates incredible economic crises. And, you, you know, last time I visited Angola in, a couple of years ago, the skyline was filled with sort of half-finished buildings with kind of grass growing out of it because there had been a big oil boom and then a crash. And um, so all this kind of stuff causes terrible trouble. Um, the Dutch disease is a phenomenon, it's kind of a price phenomenon. When all this money flows in, kind of local price levels rise, um, and that makes it harder for kind of agriculture industries to compete with imports because they're in a more expensive environment. So that deals further damage. Um, and of course, all this money flowing into government, um, people in government kind of lose interest in the sort of difficult challenges of development and they start focusing on how to get their hands on 
you know, how to get a share of the cake. Um, and that creates conflict and it also creates corruption. And for me, kind of in these places, conflict and corruption are kind of two sides of the same coin, people fighting for the resource. Um, and, and various other sort of things that happen. So anyway, so I was in Angola and then I started traveling all along West Africa's coastline, which is a, a very kind of oil soap coastline from Angola up to Nigeria. And all of these countries were suffering some version of the resource curse. It was, a, you know, each country was its own kind of story, its own politics, but, but I could see the same sort of things happening in all these places. Then in about 2007, I met this guy, John Christensen, um, who was, who had been the economic advisor to Jersey, the British tax haven, little Channel Islands tax haven. And um, he had been there, he'd been working there for, I don't know, 20 years or something, and he was kind of disgusted by what he had seen in this tax haven. And he had got a phone call one day from um, a nun and a couple of other people that he'd never heard of. Um, and they said, we want your help. They knew he was kind of like agitated and disgusted by, by the place. And he said, we want to try and tackle this tax haven on our island. Um, it's damaging our island. It's hurting our people. Um, all this money coming in seems to be making us um, less well off. And we want your help. How do we do it? And so he, he kind of um, thought about this a bit. And he thought, well, um, okay, if you want to do that, you're going to have to take on the entire global system, the economic system of tax havens. Um, I can't see another way of doing it. And they said, let's do it. So he um, took a career change at that, at that moment and decided to set up this organization called the Tax Justice Network, which is a, an organization campaigning against tax havens. And it has now become a very influential organization. I have, I'm, have a connection with it. Um, so we were talking, you know, he had been reading my stuff in the, in the paper about Angola and other African countries, and he'd been thinking, but this is Jersey. It's the same stuff going on in Jersey. The same, a lot of these same things, the same brain drain. You know, in Angola, you've had a dominant oil sector. We're in Nigeria, sucking all the best talented people out. Well, in Jersey, you had, you know, the best, the, the finance sector, sucking all the best people out of tourism, out of government, out of, you know, out of all the um, other areas. Um, and damaging other sectors, and you've got this one financial sector, and you're getting tremendous inequality. You are also getting, you know, the, the global financial crisis that happened is the finance version of those roller co coaster oil prices. You have finance has a whole kind of long term dynamic of crisis in it, um, and when you're a finance dependent economy, you get, you get, can get hit terribly hard. This same Dutch disease. Um, uh, also very extreme inequality, terrible corruption in Jersey. I was astonished when I visited Jersey for the first time um, at the tales of corruption and political corruption there. It was a very British place. It felt, you know, fish and chip shops and WH Smith and boots on the high street, and it felt totally British. But when you start talking to people about what's going on in the politics, um, another story entirely. I have to say that corruption in Britain now is starting also to get out of control. Um, uh, but John Christensen basically said, "Look, we're seeing this is the same phenomenon." And he had he had already been thinking about this, and he'd been calling it the Jersey disease. But we kind of agreed together to call it the finance curse. Um, and we realised very quickly that we weren't just talking about Jersey; we were talking about Britain. Um, and later, uh, we started applying it to the United States. So. The idea at the heart of the finance curse is that, um, you know, we all need finance. We all need it to, you know, uh, get our mortgages, to, to facilitate payments. You know, it's, it's essential for every country. But you can have too much finance. And that's really the heart of the concept of the finance curse. You can have too much finance. Once it grows too big, you have a problem. And here's the kind of simplest way of seeing it. And I don't think this would be at all controversial. The financial sector has a useful core. This is the blue bit here. These are the good bits that support productive activity in an economy. Um, and around that core, you have the bad bits. You have predation and very um, 
you know, aggressive attempt to, to you know, extract wealth from other parts of the economy. And so there's, you know, the essence of the finance curse is we should shrink the financial sector and we should shrink it, um, you know, we should shrink this down to here. And that will uh, increase prosperity. Uh, and co you know, and create, you know, and improve our democracy and many other good things. Now, this seems like a very simple and obvious concept, but it is a very, very difficult sell in Britain, which is the country that I know most. Um, it, people, it, in their kind of minds, people, it's very hard to get beyond the idea that more money can't be good for us. Will, will make us poorer. Will make us poorer. More money makes you poorer. It's kind of anti, anti you know. It just doesn't, it doesn't gel, it doesn't, people, it takes a while for people to kind of grasp this idea. And there is a widespread belief that the city of London is kind of like the engine of the British economy, and we must support it, we must protect it, we must um, give it what it wants, because the more, the bigger it is, the more money um, we, you know, trickle down to us. And the Bank of England governor, Mark Carney, even said something about this a couple of years, a few years ago, um, we, it would be great to have a financial centre twice as big as it is now. Um, and that wasn't really questioned. So it, it's a very, the, the finance curse, as much as anything, is an effort, is an attempt to reframe what's going on. And in this talk today, I'm just going to present a few little concepts, and I'd be very interested to hear from anybody which frames they think might be useful for, um, you know, which ones help them kind of uh, understand this um, well. So, in the same way that in Angola when I was there, a lot of academic research was coming out um, about uh, the resource curse, well now there's a lot of new research coming out about the finance curse. Now here is um, a shape of a graph an inverted U shape. Um, this one is the is, this is really the first of the U shaped graphs that started coming out, and this one that was from the IMF, and this one was from the IMF. This is actually in an article I wrote for them that came out a few weeks ago, um, which they updated. So it's now what this shows you is again we all need finance. When you have very little finance. It doesn't support growth, economic growth very much. And as finance gets bigger, as the financial sector becomes more developed, on this side of the graph, the Gambia kind of needs a better, more developed financial sector. But you, there is an optimal point in the middle here. And this is kind of like a stylized graph from the IMF. Um, but this is saying there's an optimal point and once you start growing beyond this optimal point, it starts damaging growth. You want to, if you're out here, this is the United States, if you shrink finance, you will actually improve your growth rate. So again, this is academic research kind of supporting the idea that in the previous slide, shrink finance um, to increase growth. And this is, again, this is a, a completely different study finding the same effect. This one is credit to the private sector this is a particular financial development in index which is far too complicated to get into here. Um, can I, can I ask yes. A very basic yes. What do you mean by financial sector? Is that just banks? Aha, uh -huh, that's uh, a very good question. Uh, yes. <coughs> yes, okay. Um, yes, so the financial sector. Um, I will be getting onto this, but just in a nutshell, it's kind of like the rings of an onion. So banks kind of you would say, I would say, are in the middle. And then around that, you get successive layers. So you get other sort of financial players, um, you know, private equity firms, hedge funds, things like that, outside that. You also get, a, there's a whole kind of zoo of, of really exotic players um, out there. But then there's another whole layer out that, uh, outside that, um, which academics call financialization. And what that is, is, the kind of penetration of finance into all the sectors of the economy, into you know aerospace, into into tourism, into into you know real estate, into um, anything you think of healthcare, agriculture, farming, um, 
And what that is, and there's a whole huge literature about this, huge financialization literature, and, and actually, um, you know, this series of talks has had quite a few speakers looking at this literature. Um, but basically, it is generally seen as a negative development. So, uh, you know, a manufacturing industry might be, uh, or a manufacturing company might be doing very well, generating a lot of profit, and then, for example, a private equity firm will come in, which I regard as a financial sector player, buy that company, and then start financially engineering it, saying this company hasn't run its affairs through tax havens enough to cut its tax bill. This company can kind of, you know, crush workers a little bit more. Let's get rid of the unions. Let's, let's get rid of the pension fund. Um, let's, um, let's buy a whole series of these companies in the same market niche, and then we've got a monopoly, and so then we can screw the consumer as well. Um, and this is all kind of maximizing wealth that is coming out of the economy. So, um, you know, we're getting closer to a kind of ex explanation of why, as we get more into the, these techniques, we start seeing more damage to the economy. And um, I should add that the British economy is much more affected this than the German economy is. Um, but. The next slide just shows, I'm not going to get into this, but this is just another, this is the Bank for International Settlements, which, is, um, which does a lot of research. Here's another pair of graphs that they've done, the same basic relationships. So it's fairly well established that, um, there's still a lot more research to do in this area, but it's fairly well established that too much finance can be bad for you. And a lot of countries are too far along this side of the curve. So here, I'm just going to give you another framework. Um, so people see all the wealth in the city of London or in Wall Street um, or in another country's banking sector, and they see all these billionaires and they think, brilliant, billionaires, money, this is good for us. Um, but I like to make this analogy. Imagine if telephone companies were suddenly full of billionaires, huge amounts, huge fortunes being made, and these telephone companies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then, but your telephone calls weren't really very good still, and they were kind of expensive and crackly and unreliable and poor service. Um, we would, we would realise that there is something wrong with this sector. So a lot of people see a financial sector as a kind of end in itself, as a sort of, we must have a bigger financial sector. Um, but the finance curse analysis kind of turns, that, turns it on its head. No, this is, the financial sector is serving, it is a service industry, and the contribution to an economy is how good its service is. And we will, I will show you some of the, um, some of the problems that it generates. Um, do we, do we, do we want to have any more questions at this stage, or are we, we okay? Is it, is it all pretty clear what the message is? It's a pretty basic message, but it's really hard to get it across. Um, so, how, what are the reasons for the problem? Well, I've already started to, um, to explain some of the issues. Um, so again, this, this brain drain that I described earlier, finance drains talent out of other, other, every other economic sector. But here's something that, this data here is from the Bank of England. Um, if anybody wants this slide, I can send it to them, or Matthew will send it to them, just email one of us. Um, but this is Bank of England data, and it's really hard to get this data out. They present it in a way that's really difficult to find. But, but the sh this is the share of UK bank lending. 3.5% um, of bank lending goes to manufacturing, 2% goes to agriculture, and 62% goes back into finance. And this is a whole, again, this menagerie of very complicated financial products, financial engineering, um, which... Uh, which is only, it, it, it's only, um, it's not written about very much, I mean, um, but this, this statistic sort of shows how unbalanced the UK economy has come. I don't have the figures for the German economy, I'm afraid, um, and at this stage I don't have the figures for the US economy. Um, but I think you'll find this is pretty dramatic. Another 15%, by the way, goes to real estate, which many people also regard as very much a financial sector. Um, uh, yeah, a financial uh, sector uh, because um, 
yeah, they call it the FIRE, F-I-R-E, Finance, Insurance and Real Estate, as the kind of a group. So this is a bit of a, I don't know about the octopus. I, <laughs> anyway, the, the reason I put an octopus, yes? Could you give an example of what type of lending in the previous slide? Um, what type of lending okay. is it? What, what well, for example, um, I mean, from the global financial crisis, most people will have heard of CDOs, or many people will have heard of CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. So what they will do is they'll get um, and collateralized loan obligations, and there's a whole kind of menagerie of these different things that were very substantially behind the global financial crisis that erupted. These things kind of collapsed. So you would have uh, a mortgage. You... Uh, you know, the bank lends you half a million to buy an apartment and then you owe the bank these, um, you know, over 25 years or whatever, you know, this much every month or every year or whatever. So you've got this payment stream, this regular payment stream and what the banks will do, they'll get a bundle of these things together and they will create um, a series of these payment streams um, and then they will package it all up and they've got this, it's like a bundle of contracts. And they say, we've got this bundle of contracts. And these payment streams are obviously incredibly valuable, so they can sell them, you know. Um, and other people will borrow money to buy those kinds of things. So it's, it's kind of, there's a lot of complexity involved. But it's buying, a lot of it is packaging up future income streams into the present. And like this is worth a lot of money now. Um, somebody else takes it off my hands, they give me a load of cash and I'm rich or I do something else with it. Um, but it's that kind of thing. And, um, and there's a lot of lending required to, you know, people borrow to, to buy these things. And, and so it's this kind of complicated um, financial engineering. There's, yeah, there's, there's trillions of this stuff circulating round and round. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've read something about um, a large equity firm buying up these student loans in America. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so they will get exactly student loans. They will, you know, that's another. Um, the the rep repayments are valuable, you know, regular sources of income, and they get packaged up. Car loans is another one. Um, uh, you know, pretty much anything that can be bundled up into. into What's the incentive of a bank selling on these packages to finance? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, they they can make money off it. Is the simple answer. By, um, if you have one mortgage, you know, that person has a certain probability of not being able to repay. If you put 100 mortgages together, you can then get a much more accurate belief in how much, um, how much, uh, you know, the likelihood of repayment and stuff like that. And you can then, um, you know, you can sell it to somebody else who has a, you know, every, uh, different players, hedge funds, whatever, have different appetites for risk. There are different niches. Some people want to lend into, you know, want to get into collateralized loan obligations, a lot of credit being created, um, uh, and they can lend, lend the money. And, and so there's a lot, it's like a whole ecosystem. It's a massive kind of financial ecosystem with lots and lots of little niches that people are, you know, somebody can um, create something that is perceived by someone else to be more value than it was before they created it. So they can then sell it on to somebody. Who has it? Who thinks that it's worth something more than the individual pieces? It's like getting, you know, uh, a pizza and cutting it into slices, and then you put some different toppings on the different slices, and they're kind of like packaged up differently. And you can, instead of, you know, you cut a ten-dollar pizza into ten slices, you put lots of different toppings on the different pieces. You can sell each for one fifty, and then you made it, made money like that. It's kind of something like that. Um, but it's, it's a good question. Um, it, there are many, many different ways, but it is, um, yes, it's, there's a lot of money involved. Okay. Um, the reason I put an octopus here in, um, I don't know if that's an overly sinister picture, but I like this octopus. But basically, um, private equity firms often, um, again, it's an example of a sector with a useful core around which there is a lot of, um, in many cases, a lot of kind of more predatory activity. So what, pri you know, the, the sort of good part of private equity is they buy up companies and um, 
they might be badly performing companies and they'll, they'll you know, put in better managers and make them run better and you know, create wealth and just make the company better. And there's plenty of examples of that. But there are a lot of people, um, the owners of these private equity companies, who do what I was describing earlier, where they buy these things up and then they look at all the different stakeholders and they think, how can we shake down each of these stakeholders? What can we do to get more money out of each one? Um, and one of the things that surprised me when I was, invest when I was investigating this was um, the, the co-investors. So you basically you get the titans, the, you know, the moguls, the people you've heard of who run the show, who will then get a load of other people to invest alongside them. So they, get, they contribute to a pool of money and then this pool, from this pool of money they go out and buy companies. Um, so, but those co-investors who are co investing alongside them are also people you can shake down. And there was one um, statistic in the UK edition of my book, um, a guy called Simon Lack, this looked at hedge funds, um, not private equity, but they're quite similar. Do, do I need to explain? I probably do need to explain the difference between that. Okay. Okay. So, um, the difference between private equity and hedge funds, the basic difference is both of them involve outside investors putting in a lot of money and creating a huge pool. And then the, 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 the moguls, the people running the ship, will then do something with this pool of money. With private equity, they'll go and buy a company, go and buy a company that's making shoes or something like that. And then they'll do this, you know, they'll, they'll try and make money out of that. With hedge funds, it's, it's different kind of things they do. They don't buy up companies. They will tend to, you know, do derivatives or get into foreign exchange markets and do these sort of or high frequency trading or stuff like that. But basically, the basic idea for both of them is you get other people to put their money in so imagine you get 10 billion worth of funds from other people's money. You put in a little bit of your own money, but as little as, as you can get away with. And then you start taking fees out of that huge pool. So every year you're investing it. You're you, you, they've got a formula that called 2 and 20, which um, at, at its simplest level, you take 2% of the value of that pool every year for yourself. And... 20, you take 20% of the profits of that, that you make from investing in all these different things. Um, so you can get very rich indeed. If you do make a lot of profits for your co-investors and they do very well, then they'll be very happy with that. Um, but if you don't, you may still be taking that 2%. Even if you're making a loss, you may still be taking your 2%. So you as the, as the private equity mogul can get very rich indeed. Um, and that's Basically, that's a very basic description of these of these financial sector players that I believe are, are you know an important important part of the finance finance curse. And the reason I use an octopus is because each tentacle is reaching out to a a stakeholder of some kind. Um, so whether it's the taxpayer, whether it's um, consumers, whether it's um, workers, whether it's suppliers, um, in identifying all the stake stakeholders. And again, this is this concept of extraction. Now, I forgot to ask, when, so does that explain, did that explain, okay, I forgot to ask the technical person if I could, if this was going to work. Matthew, do you know if we're online here? Do you know if we're online here? If I can click on this and get a YouTube video, it's a very short YouTube video. You need a password. Oh, you need a password to go online, okay, right. okay, forget it, all right. So this is, I think you probably all recognise this man. Um, when this video was taken in 2012, he was the mayor of London, and now he's uh, our prime minister, Boris Johnson. Um, the key quote in this video, which is worth watching, is, you will generate jobs and growth in Strathclyde, which is in Scotland, far more effectively if you invest in Hackney or in Croydon or in other parts of London. So this is about the geography of the finance curse. Um, and I, um, I look at this both in the UK and in the US. If we have time, I'll tell you about my time in Iowa talking to hog farmers. 
about the financialization of hog farming. Um, but let's see how we go. I'm just going to focus on Boris Johnson now. So this is the idea that London is the engine of the British economy. Again, going back to that difficult, you know, the, the sort of public image of the, the city of London in the UK, that London is the engine of the British economy and we must feed it, we must support it, we must, mustn't tax it too much, mustn't regulate it too much, we must let it do its, its thing and it will shower jobs and tax revenues on the rest of the country. And this is Boris Johnson saying, um, you will generate jobs in Strathclyde in Scotland far more effectively if you invest in London. Invest in London, create, you know, feed the machine and it will spread the wealth everywhere. Well, so I took Boris Johnson at his word and I, I went and looked at something in Strathclyde, which, by the way, is an administrative area of Scotland that was abolished long ago. But there, I found a thing called the Strathclyde Police Training Centre, which was inaugurated by Prince Charles in 2002 um, under a thing called the Private Finance Initiative. And what that was, was the Labour government of Tony Blair decided it wanted to spend more without being seen to spend more. So instead of paying for things like police training centres out of the budget, they would um, outsource the whole thing to a private sector player who would then build it, but they would also finance it as well. And then the government would pay them back over 25 years for the training centre. Well, so I looked at the official data on this Strathclyde Police Training Centre, um, which, according to the official data, £18 million to build it. So it was a decent size um, training centre near Glasgow. Um, but then I looked at the repayments over 25 years, 26 years actually, um, of what the company, the private company that was financing and um, building this thing would get. And over 20, 26 years it was going to get £112 million. So uh, seven or eight times what the thing cost to build. Now there are some financing costs. If you, if the government had just borrowed the money and built that, it would have, it would have. Um, I worked out uh, it would have cost about thirty-seven million pounds. So it's not all extraction. It's not all money kind of financially engineered. But a lot of it is. And if you and I looked also at the company itself. What was this company? Who owned it? Um, that was building this Strathclyde Police Training Centre and making an enormous amount of money out of it. Well, this is what it looked like. Um, I, I'll just run through it just to show you how ridiculous it is. But um, the thing at the bottom, the, the thing that actually built the thing, Strathclyde Limited Partnership, um, had two partners, Strathclyde Limited, IPP St Properties Strathclyde Limited, and fields, and then you go up the next companies up, Field Second Limited, then IPP, PFI Holdings, and it goes on and 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 on. And this actually doesn't get to the end of it. There is more, but I couldn't fit it on this slide. It ends up, um, uh, there are lots of side things going off, there's lots of debts coming in, coming out, um, but it ends up with a, a group called Hunt Companies um, based in El Paso, Texas. Um, which does this kind of thing. And they do lots of, they have loads and loads of these structures all over the world. But this, for me, is, um, again, a, a kind of extraction machine. It, it like shows the contrast between wealth creation, um, you know, making something useful, making widgets, making a better service, um, you know, better provision of tourism services or whatever, um, and wealth extraction, that, that's kind of like the key concept, one of the two key concepts at the centre of the whole finance curse thesis. So this is a wealth extraction machine for me um, around this useful thing that they've done, which is they have finance and they have built a police training centre. There's all this other stuff, this kind of shell around it of other stuff that's um, basically taken an enormous amount of money away from Scottish police budgets. So... Um, when we have Boris Johnson saying we are providing all the money to Scotland, we in London, you know, we're the wealth creations. In fact, this shows a pipeline, a much more hidden pipeline, going in the other direction, out of police Scottish police budgets into London. So London is where a lot of these kind of extraction machines, the headquarters are, and there's sort of 
all this money is coming into London. So in a sense, London is feeding, in, in, in this sense, is, is feeding across the rest of the country. It is obviously a very complicated picture. There's lots of good stuff done in London, and there's lots of this kind of stuff as well. But the headquarters of nearly all of these companies um, here was uh, in a place near Tower Bridge in London. And all the kind of um, all the services that these provided, and the, but there's you know other stuff in tax havens, there's all sorts. But this is a complicated extraction machine. And an, another answer to your question is, you know, there's a lot of borrowing going on in here. So a lot of this stuff is going into these kinds of creatures as well. A lot of this finance, um, they call it finance and auxiliary finance. So. And this Strathclyde structure, I only picked it because Johnson, Boris Johnson said that thing about Strathclyde, but this was from a document with 600 or 700 different um, similar things going on, and they were all, all the ones I looked at had pretty much the same structure, same financialized structure. Um, so somebody put it in these terms, this is the metropolitanization of gains and the nationalization of losses. Um, oh, uh, people with me, at this stage, any questions? Are we clear? Okay. Um, so we are getting fairly close to the end. So I think we've got time for me to tell you a little bit about my time hog farming in, in, in Iowa. So there's nothing like, there's nothing really as emblematic as agriculture. Uh, if you're going to talk about wealth creation, you know, you put seeds in the ground, into the soils, water, sunshine, machinery, and you create food and you know, animals and, and wealth. What has happened since the 1980s in particular was an astonishing story of what used to be a kind of circulatory system in these local economies. So, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have seen the film Back to the Future, but if you remember it, those of you who've seen it, it's got some th scenes of it. I saw this one while I was in Iowa, I just happened to see it. Um, but you get a really good sense of this small town in rural America, this fictional small town with um, you know, just a thriving place with loads of shops and teenagers running all over the place and, and just life and drive-in cinemas and stuff like that. Um, and that you know, did reflect what was going on. I think it was set in the mid-50s, Back to the Future. Um, and... What you had then was you had, you, the, the sort of wealth was circulating. You would have, you know, the farmer would be buying seeds locally, would be buying veterinary services locally, would be buying um, uh, machinery from the local supplier. So all this money was kind of, you know, going to the doctor locally, going to the local restaurants, all this money was kind of circulating um, locally. But what happened after that? And the Iowa that I visited, um, these towns, these small towns, I went to one that was really similar, it really looked similar to the one in Back to the Future, the sort of same size town square, and um, it was really a very different story, I think, you know, many people have seen. It's not just, you know, Midwestern America, I mean, high streets in Britain, um, a lot of places in small towns are, are kind of like, you know, what we have, you'll have a pound shop, you'll have a betting shop, you'll have a charity shop, and um, maybe a, you know, curry house if you're lucky and not that much else. Um, all these kind of local industries, local businesses seem to have kind of closed down. And one of the main reasons for this is again, what I would call is a part of the financialization story, which is um, in this case, all of these functions are being taken in-house by a very few uh, big firms. So where you used to have a diverse kind of competitive landscape of lots of different businesses kind of, you know, uh, paying each other's, um, you know, lunch. Now, all this stuff that used to be circulating has kind of been unrolled by these big firms. They have pushed, they have used all sorts of um, mechanisms to push all these little players out of business. Um, and the re relaxation of antitrust laws, particularly since the Reagan era, allowed them to start crushing all their competitors and all these markets 
had been winking out of existence steadily. It happened first with chickens, and they call, and they call this process the chickenization. And um, then uh, hogs are near, nearly at the end of this process. Beef is kind of, we're in the middle of this process now. And um, all these businesses have given way to this much bigger, you know, bigger, big agriculture. Um, and big agriculture, all the, you know, the machinery will be provided by the big agricultural firm to the local farmer. There'll be no choice. It's in the contract. Same with veterinary services. The vet will come. You have, you have to be there when the vet comes. Um, uh, and all of these things, you know, the, 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 the seeds, you know, the big pharmaceutical companies maybe will be, ha have a deal with the big agricultural firm. You must have these seeds, you know, genetics. All of this stuff has been taken in-house. So the profits for these are all realized now somewhere else, and this, um, this kind of circulatory system has been opened out, and it's now more like a conveyor belt taking wealth out. So even though mechanization has really multiplied the wealth creation in, um, in rural America many times over, I mean, it really has dramatically increased yields and all this kind of technology, the money is no longer circulating locally and it's ending up going to, you know, the dreaded coastal elite centers, you know, New York, but also Chicago and, and other metropolitan centers where the sort of more financial players are. That's where the money's ending up. So you have, a, you know, a, quite an impoverishment of, of rural areas and a very visible set of people getting rich in the coastal areas. And obviously that's a recipe for um, uh, political extremism. And this is, um, you know, so the finance curse for me is uh, a very important um, explanation for all the political extremism that we're seeing um, in the world today. And, you know, there's a lot of financialization going on all over Europe, but I think Britain and the United States are kind of the poster children for this. Um, okay, I've got a slide here saying overall damage. I think we've kind of covered that now. We're getting towards the end. Um, there's all sorts of other damage from the finance curse, um, the political damage from all these huge amounts of money flowing in. Again, we see, you know, people say, oh, there's money coming in from overseas, you know, coming through the tax havens, you know, billionaires bringing their wealth in here. Well, this stuff is very, very dangerous. It's very politically dangerous. So it's another example of how too much money can make you worse off. Um, this paradox, the paradox of plenty. Um, so, I'll get to the end now. I think we're, um, we're just about, we'll have time for some more questions. But I think this actually, even though the finance case is kind of like a, a horrible name, I think some people like it, some people don't. Um, I think it actually carries a very hopeful message. Um, in, before getting into this, the Iowa example, I think, helps explain why this is a hopeful message because people, most people think, they think, oh, mechanization, you know, killing jobs, that's what the problem is, but that's progress and we can't roll it back. Um, you know, that's the way the world's got to go. But my message is no, um, you don't have to roll it back. You don't have to roll it back to some kind of ideal bucolic past um, uh, that isn't realistic and isn't attainable anymore. Because what happens if you have these local circulatory systems, you have a lot more wealth created, that wealth will circulate locally and you will kind of repair, you will start to repair all the damage. So it's not mechanization that you need to roll back, it's the finance curse that you need to roll back, it's the extraction mechanisms. You need to start getting stronger antitrust laws again in agriculture in the United States to start allowing competition to take off again, to start allowing farmers to have, you know, grow corn and to have a, a, a range of possible people they can sell it to so that they can, they can you know, so that prices, um, they can get a fair price. But at the moment, there's no competition. They have basically one person they can sell their hogs to. Um, and that, that large player can tell them, can, can decide on the price. And there's a fantastic book called The Meat Racket, if you're interested in this, that, will, that describes a sort of harrowing series of tales of people who thought they could play this game. They thought they could work for a big agricultural firm 
and they, the, the firm just had so many levers to push them down and it just realised how close it could get them to the bread line before they would crack and it just kept them there and eventually they did crack and then some, um, I think in this case there were Vietnamese farmers came in and they said, and I think they thought, okay, we can, we're tougher, we can, you know, we can withstand this, we're, we're better at it, but the firm just pushed them to the, you know, right to the limit as well and they, they, they went bankrupt as well. So it's this kind of stuff that can be rolled back um, very easily. You don't need to go back to, a, to an ideal past. You don't need to roll back progress. You don't need to roll back mechanization. You just need to realize where these extraction mechanisms are in the economy and roll those back. And I think that's very doable. I think it's very possible. I think it's not hopeless at all. I don't think there's an inevitability about the way things have been, um, the way a lot of our, um, uh, uh, I mean, we don't see it so obviously here in Berlin, but, but in so many parts of the world, we've had really desperate situations and people sort of throw their hands up and say, there's nothing we can really do about it because this is the way the world is going. Um, so, and, and in Britain, the version, the, 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 there's this thing called competitiveness. They always talk about, we've got to have a competitive financial sector. We've got to keep, you know, we can't tax it too much, can't regulate it too much because it'll all, you know, we'll lose jobs and the city will shrink and, um, you know, it'll all run away to Singapore or Hong Kong or wherever. Um, and this mindset is very, very prevalent. And the Conservative Party, Boris Johnson's always going on about it. They, call, they actually call it the Singapore and Thames model. And it's almost unquestioned um, in large parts of the media in the UK. And I think there are versions of it in, in every country. Um, so people think there's kind of like a trade-off, you know, between democracy and, and prosperity. You know, if we have too much democracy, we'll be poorer. And so, we, you know, that, that's just a recipe for inaction, for letting this stuff happen. And it does happen under its own momentum. Um, and there's all these kind of anxiety-inducing Competitiveness rankings. You know, we've got to, oh God, we're you know, London, we're down in second place. We quit. We've got to, you know, deregulate a bit more. And then we'll be back in top spot. And they love these rankings, um, and they serve very important political purposes. But at the end of the day, if a more competitive financial sector means the city of London is big, city of London is, London is bigger, and it will be those more extractive mechanisms which are encouraged by these anti-democratic policies that we put in place. Um, the reasons for that, we don't have time for. But um, basically, we can roll this sort of, sort of st stuff out. We can have our cake up and eat it. We can have more democracy, and we will be more economically prosperous for it. And that's the sort of, um, that's the basic idea that I'm trying to get across with my book, The Finance Curse, to try and persuade people in Britain and the United States that this is a valuable way forward. And I think there's a lot of politicians in the United States, or a few politicians in the United States, who have seen this. This is an issue, this is my last slide, by the way, so. Um, this is an issue that does not belong to any part of the political spectrum necessarily, because this is about the corruption of markets, it's about the rigging of markets. Um, and I think, okay, the Trump Republicans are one thing, but I think the Republican Party has the potential to heal itself and take this stuff on. The Democrats certainly have got some people like Elizabeth Warren, um, maybe Bernie, um, and, and a few others who are, who are looking at this stuff very closely and are making recommendations and are making platforms that are actually turning out to be quite popular. Even there's a Republican Senator, Marco Rubio, who put out a document in May, which I was astonished at. It was really, really good. It was. Look at all this finance stuff going on in our economy. We need to roll this back. So this is not something that is really a left or right issue. Um, generally, lefties will, people who call themselves the lefties will be more sympathetic to this message. But I think there's a large part of the, of the other political spectrum that can take this um, on board. So, yeah. And just while we're on the subject of politics, um, it, we, we can definitely take a moment. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, 
the, the take on the more underlying issues? Uh, is there a lot of overlap? And then just related to that, is there anyone in the UK who you feel like is uh, addressing these issues? In the, in the okay, society? yeah, good question. Okay, Elizabeth Warren, I think, I've looked at a couple of things she's done, not in great detail, but enough to be pretty clear about what she's trying to do. One is the antitrust thing. Um, she's really going for that, and that's really powerful, and I totally agree with her general tr thrust of things. There is a particular um, NGO in Washington, D.C. called the Open Markets Institute, which are kind of like they're the think tank for all this sort of stuff. And now quite a few candidates are taking, taking this on, up to a point. Um, but Elizabeth Warren, I think, is furthest ahead in developing how to turn this into a program. Um, Bernie, uh, I think he's sympathetic to it, but I don't, I, I think he has a serious, but basically there's two things here. One is um, redistribution, you know, take wealth away from rich people and tax it and give it to, um, you know, poor people. But the other thing is fixing markets. And I think Elizabeth Warren is more about, fi and, and the finance curse is more about fixing markets. I'm not against redistribution, I think it's necessary but that's not what my book is about. Um, so Elizabeth War Warren's program is closer to what I would say. Another thing, she, she's done a, a thing called, I think it's called the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, which is basically targeting private equity, which again, I think is, is looking at some of the really fundamental problems with some of the techniques that they can use um, uh, to, you know, the extractive part of what they do. She's she's looked at some, some, some really fundamental stuff. So I think she is probably the closest that, I mean, I haven't looked at all of the candidates, but I, she seems to be the closest to what I'm looking at. Um, in Britain, oh. well, okay, the Conservatives um, are a lost cause at this stage. They're just, there's, I haven't seen anybody. I mean, there's a few people in the Conservative Commentariat who don't like rig rigged markets. And I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of sort of suspicion among ordinary voters who would vote conservative of tax havens, like this is clearly, you know, secrecy is somehow wrong, you know, it's rotten markets, and, and I think, you know, there's a certain amount of sympathy, but, but the people in charge, um, one of the, uh, one of the, um, there's this guy called David Marchant in um, Miami, who's a, a, an investigator of tax havens, and he told me that when he sees um, Lord or Sir or these kind of British, you know, high society appellations in the, in the tax haven structure, he takes it as a red flag because the British establishment has become so kind of thoroughly corrupted um, and the Conservatives have been in power for quite a long time, but also Tony Blair's Labour was full of quite a lot of these sorts of people. Um, tax havens are so central to the British elite establishment now that it's kind of everywhere. Jeremy Corbyn, is another story. He's more like Bernie. Uh, he's quite old-fashioned. I don't. I think he probably is sympathetic to this stuff, but I don't think I haven't seen much that is very kind of profound in these terms. Um, but I haven't. I don't know. I mean, other. Yeah. Were you going to make a comment on this point or? Just, I was wondering if you did the Preston. Ah, the Preston model, yes. Uh, you, I mean, if you're asking the question, you probably know more about it than I do. But the Preston model is, um, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know much about it, but it is basically an idea that um, in Preston's small part of the UK, um, they have decided instead of, to as much as possible, source things locally, keep money circulating locally. So going back to these kind of local circulatory systems. And um, it seems to be doing quite well, I think. But do you know more about it than I, than I do? Do you have no, any? No. no. I think, but I think it is, it is a little experiment that's going on. And As an idea to me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's an interesting idea. And I think it's not the only one. I think there's, you know, various places in Spain that are trying to do similar stuff. And it, it is, it, it's very much sort of a small local, local idea. And um, so far, I think early days, things seem to be going quite well. But, you know, you never know what's going to happen happen with these things that are hostages to, to fortune, but, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I heard something on NPR that made me think of your book, and but it had to do with currency markets. Okay. And traditionally, the uh, fragility of third world uh, country politics had a, a big influence on their currency markets. And now today, say, a country like the seems to be very vulnerable to any 
any political swing, the markets go right with it, just like a third world country, which I think is, you know, corresponds pretty well with what you've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, the pound has fallen a lot. The pound, well, I mean, it's fall, it was 15 years ago, it was like $2 to the pound, and now it's like $1.30 or something like that. I don't know, something like that. So it's fallen quite, quite a long way. I mean, Brexit's got a fair bit to do with it. Um, but again, Brexit is, for me, significantly a function of the finance cuts. It's a function of all the anger and the resentment generated by this kind of dual economy. Of, um, uh, yeah, of, of some very visible, very wealthy winners, um, relatively small numbers and much larger numbers of, of losers. Um, but there is a, there's an article I just read called the... Um, uh, oh God, is Britain undeveloping before our eyes? And it's a really interesting article about how Britain, um, you know, it's a, it hasn't got a developmental strategy. Um, it hasn't, the developmental strategy is we must have a big city of London. That's our golden goose that lays the golden eggs. And that is its strategy. And it doesn't have anything else. And now it's falling victim to this. You know, the financial crisis kind of created one round of damage. And now, you know, things just aren't getting any better. And one of the problems was that when the, cri when the crisis happened, when the financial crisis happened, there were not really any ideas lying around for people to sort of take up and hear, here's a completely different way of doing things. I think now, you know, a lot of people, people are always talking about the possibility of a new financial crisis. But if one comes, um, I think there are now a lot of ideas um, floating around that could create some new ways of doing things. Um, so that's a bit of a waffly answer to your question. But oh, one more question? Yeah. Um, aside from xenophobia, do you think that the city of, city of London is also very much behind Brexit to protect mm -hmm. themselves from European... Um, I, I, I think it's a very complicated picture there. I think generally most sort of big institutions in the city of London haven't been particularly keen on Brexit because Brexit because membership of the European Union gives them a kind of passport to operate across Europe and Brexit will throw all that into confusion. So I think generally the big players haven't. But there are various hedge funds and people who who um, I mean, there, there are some stories out there recently that there have been some of the biggest back, backers of Brexit have been hedge fund people like Crispy and OD have been backers or have been shorting the pound and making huge amounts of money about it. I, I, I'm not sure that's a controversial topic, but I think there are a lot of people in, in this world, in the world of, of this more exotic finance that are really into this Singapore on Thames model. You know, once we're free of the bonds of Europe, we can stride free and and gloriously, you know, deregulate and cut all the taxes of the corporations and massive investment will come in and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the companies that will make, people who make the most out of that is the hedge fund kind, kinds of people who, who can, you know, all this financial engineering. It's turning Britain more and more into a tax haven. It already is substantially a tax haven. But I think, so I think there's a lot of very influential people who have become influential in the Conservative Party who either ideologically or they think they can do well out of it personally, think Brexit is a great idea. And of course, there are all the, you know, there's a whole other story with the media and, you know, billionaire who are owners of, you know, the Barclay brothers and Rupert Murdoch and all these people who have their own reasons um, for backing Brexit. But yes, I think the city has got a lot to do with it, but it's a, a complicated picture. So, yes. Good talk, Nick. Thank you very much. Thanks. And two questions. Um, one is if you, can you give us sort of three specific, you know, if you became Prime Minister tomorrow, what would be sort of three specific things you would do in the UK? Right. Actually? That's the first question. Yes. <laughs> I love that question, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm serious. What yeah, 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 yeah. What measures would you take? Yes, yes. Secondly, okay. three. Two can or I, four? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll see how many I can come up with. Okay. Um, uh, are, there, are there any lessons you can learn from, or we can learn from, from say, the work on tax, uh, tax havens? And you know, a few, ten years ago, nobody found tax havens a problem, and or even five years ago, people didn't see the fact that big companies don't pay taxes much a problem. Now they find that a problem. <coughs> You've talked persuasively about the problem of communicating this this yeah. challenge to the public. Yeah. 
you and others have been successful in communicating that problem and making it mainstream. Do you have ideas about how you can, we can try to do that, make it mainstream the, the problem in order to make it more attractive and more appealing and therefore more politically um, acceptable? Yeah, okay. Um, so what, if I were Prime Minister, what would I do? I mean, I think overall what I would do is identify the places in the economy where massive fortunes are being made. And in general terms, and not necessarily in every case, but in general terms, those massive fortunes will be the result of some kind of, um, you know, when, you know, a really, you know, many economists would say sort of the best kind of sector to have is manufacturing or some manufacturing is brilliant because you've got these long supply chains creating all these little ecosystems of industries around your businesses and um, you know the managers will send their kids to local schools and it's all really embedded in your economy and ge generating lots of lots of kind of jobs and stuff but it's really hard to make huge profits in manufacturing um, unless you're Apple um, but then Apple isn't so much a manufacturing company as a you know it's a sort of financial vehicle with makes phones um, but uh, but that kind of stuff that's embedded, that's really kind of, you know, it, it, it's rooted in your local economy, that's not going to be scared away by a better tax, you know, tax it a bit more. They're not going to suddenly rip themselves out, rip their kids out of schools and go off to Singapore. I mean, it does happen, but generally, when you rate, you know, when you put kind of more, um, you know, democratic, useful things... Um, on, on these businesses. Generally, that kind of business, the good stuff, will tend to stay in place. So you, you, you need to think about this kind of thing. Um, I, would look at the, I would look at the private equity sector um, quite particularly because, first of all, it is a place where vast fortunes are being made by a very small number of people. But also, they have been pioneers of a lot of these techniques that have then spread to other, like this, this company here, the one with all those... 20 companies sitting on top of each other in this huge kind of corporate tower. That wasn't a, that's not a private equity firm, but these techniques have been kind of pioneered by private equity. So I would look at those techniques and um, find ways. And I think Elizabeth Warren has done some good work there was, um, in, in sort of identifying what the techniques are. Um, you know, there's a whole tax haven thing they do. There's a whole thing with limited liability, basically. Um, uh, a limited liability company, you know, if you put a tiny amount of your own money into, into a limited liability company, then if that thing goes bankrupt, you're only liable for that little bit of money you put in and all the sort of pain can go on other, other people's shoulders. But if it, if it does really well, then you make huge amounts of money. So it's kind of like a um, you know, one-way bet that they're involved in. So that kind of thing um, I, I would look into um, trying to do something about. Um, yeah, but that, that would be the sort of general way of looking at it, I think. Um, I think redistribution, you know, I'm also, I, I'm also a, to a fair degree, a redistributionist. I think wealth taxes are a useful thing and, and popular. Um, you know, wealth taxes above a certain level of income or above a certain level of wealth. Um, Thomas Piketty, I think, was advocating, you know, 90% wealth tax on fortunes above a certain size. I can't remember the details, but, but there's some really radical suggestions out there. Um, Gabriel Zuckerman is advocating 10% annual tax on fortunes above a billion um, in the United States, um, which is radical, and, but it's pretty popular. So these kinds of things can be done. I mean, does anybody need more than a billion dollars? I don't know. Um, um, so that kind of thing. And the second question, yes, how do you... How do you change hearts and minds? Well, one thing that I'm personally trying to do with Leo, my cameraman over here, well, as someone I'm working with, um, is we're trying to make a film about this. We've just started putting together the first ideas, the first concepts, and we're going to the US in November to start filming and doing interviews. But we're gonna, we, we might call it the finance curse, we might call it something else. Um, there's um, three others of us, uh, two others, well, three others including Danny. Um, uh, and Leo uh, is um, connected to Public Service International, the uh, international trade union body. Uh, and we are planning to... So the book itself is, 
it's you know I try to sort of make it journalistic and tell stories of real people and stuff like that but it's still there's a lot of analysis in there but the film we want to take a completely different approach we want to basically tell the stories of three people and follow their lives and hang the analysis on their kind of own personal stories um, so we want we want to at the moment we're thinking of you know a US farmer um, in the Midwest um, going through all this stuff we're thinking of maybe a cleaner or someone like that in Bermuda, the tax haven of Bermuda, where things are, sh the poverty is shocking. There was a German filmmaker was there not so long ago, and apparently it's really appalling what's going on there. You know, there's a, that's a tiny little tax haven with like 50,000 people, trillions of corporate money coming through it, and massive poverty in this place. And there's a few people, a few people getting very rich, or a significant number of people getting very rich indeed. Most of those people are kind of white, ex white male expatriates from outside of Bermuda. So... You know the benefits to the, even this tiny little place with all this huge amounts of money coming through doesn't it doesn't seem to be developing the local economy very well, um, and it seems to be harming. And there's debtors, prisons, and all sorts of horrible things going on. People living in caves, people living in um, you know tent cities, and, and yeah. So this is a real example. Of, so we we want to find a person there who will be able to you know just follow their lives, and this is what it's like, and just kind of just to sort of frame you know these stories and yeah and then maybe a nurse or someone in the UK in Manchester or something like that who works for in the finance curse book I found a couple of um, home carers who work for a private private equity firm they didn't know they worked for a private equity firm because it had this massive corporate tower on top of it another one of these massive towers but they did and their lives were horrendous so you know someone like that so that's kind of a small thing how did we why so that what Hugh is talking about is tax havens. So um, John Christensen, who set up the Tax Justice Network, that network, which I, have, which I joined afterwards, and I still work part-time for them, um, has, was immensely influential in putting tax havens onto the international agenda. Until TJN came along, um, tax havens were viewed by most people as a kind of exotic sideshow to the global economy, something that's sort of, you know, mafiosi and a few criminals go there, but nothing too bad. But this organisation basically put together this analysis saying, one, it's much, much bigger. It's right at the centre of everything, financial globalisation. Tax havens are right at the centre of this thing. And two, it's much bigger than you think. Um, it's trillions. Um, you know, the biggest estimate is like 40 trillion US dollars worth sitting in tax havens. That, you know, that much money... If you lay dollar bills end to end, would stretch, I think, something like ten times along the Earth's orbit around the Sun. I mean, it's huge amounts of money. Um, but but basically, so putting just putting these kind of messages out there, just as we were putting those messages out there, the global financial crisis hit. So that really helped. So that was a massive wave that suddenly people, you know, governments were saying. First of all, governments were saying we need new sources of revenue. Oh look, there's all these rich people hiding their money in tax havens. Politically, very easy to go after. Um, the, the problem was that a lot of those rich people were in those same governments making those decisions, so you had a bit of a mess. Um, but there's been a lot of progress since then. Um, but also populations getting very angry about all this stuff. And then stuff like the Panama Papers, you know, so we were saying all this stuff about tax havens, and I wrote Treasure Islands, and there's people saying, you know, it's, nah, it's just making it up. And, and then the Panama Papers came out, and it's like laid it out. So there's been a series of kind of events that have helped shape our message but I think there's a whole undercurrent of anger and people can feel in their gut that there's something wrong with the world economy and they're looking for sort of an analysis and I think you know we just need to uh, you know I mean uh, there are, you know I'm not the only one making this analysis there's plenty of people academics talking about financialization Grace Blakely who'll be speaking here has um, is a quite a prominent commentator in the UK on the left um, and she has just got a book out called Stolen, How to Save Democracy from Financialization, um, book focused on the UK. So there's, you know, there's others with this, with very similar messages. I mean, she's got a lot of different stuff that she will say that's, and, you know, I hope it's not my thing, but, um, but I think there are a lot of people now starting to make these arguments. So I think these arguments will come. I think we're still in the early days. And again, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to sort of apply this enough to Germany, because that would be really interesting. I think there's, you know, there's plenty of, private equity activity in German real estate, for example, that would be very interesting to look at. Um, anyway. Okay. Uh, yes? Um, How much? Yeah. Uh, so far, we've been talking about politics from top down, but 
yes. Do you think there are opportunities um, to um, work or remedy somehow uh, bottom up in terms of, for instance, also in administration? Because your example from Strathclyde yes. police station, surely someone had to sign whatever contract it was. Yes. Um, you know, you mean in public administration or in... Yeah. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think the problem is that in the UK, again, putting this on the UK, the people at the very top of the political system who decide these things have decided that this is the way to go. And so you can have people lower down, um, lower down in these structures who might feel uncomfortable about what, what is going on, but they don't really have any power at all to change the system. I think. If you're talking about grassroots kind of bottom-up change, I think um, it is a question of showing people what's going on and having much, you know, and thinking, you know, more in terms of voters, but not just in terms of voters. I mean, people, you know, local people can organise. There was discussion about the Preston model. Um, you know, trade unions are very important. And, you know, sort of forces pushing back in, in different directions. I think there's lots of different ways of doing this. But I think you're right. I do talk too much about the... Um, the stuff at the top and I think it's no I mean because when, when I you know when I do these talks I often get you know the question you know well, what can we do about it and that's like it's a difficult one um, it depends you know what what you what you're doing I, I kind of hate that question but it does come <laughs> around um, but it's very important and and we I was just talking to Leah at the beginning of this thing you know how are we gonna how are we gonna answer that question in the film so any suggestions welcome do we still have some more time? Have we, have we got time for one more? Last one? Um, so as the proportion of uh, PFIs in yeah. the UK government, has that increased or decreased uh, since the 2008 2009 financial crisis? It has decreased. It actually, and I said it started with, with the Tony Blair's Labour. It actually, there was a tiny bit of it before with John Major, and, but it really exploded with Labour. And, now that's over, and it's been so discredited now, the PFI model. And these numbers, um, you know, it's, it's kind of quite well known among people who watch these things that this stuff is, this PFI private finance initiative mechanism of outsourcing it to get them not just to build the stuff but to finance it as well has been a disaster. They call it the two hospital, the two, um, one, not, one hospital for the price of two model. Um, and so that it's kind of quite well known now, and so it's very hard for them to put new stuff out there. So it, it has, but having said that, there are organisations like the World Bank that are really now starting to push um, all these kind of exotic financing mechanisms onto poorer countries. And Daniela Gabor, who will be speaking here, has signed a letter of a, a bunch of academics saying this is a really dangerous development because basically, you know, there's trillions. Of mo amounts of money in this system, and the World Bank's idea is: look, we got let's get some of those trillions and get them into poorer countries. But the problem with that is, th this money needs very high returns, and it's going to get it. And you know they're going to may lend some money to poorer country. Half the money might disappear into private bank accounts, and the rest of the time they're going to be expected to pay kind of 25% annual returns back out again, so this is very dangerous stuff. Uh, yeah. so those poorer countries, um, what other central bank controls for those poorer countries? Because uh, since the 2008 2009 financial crisis, um, government debt to a large extent in reality has been uh, serviced by uh, the central banks, mm -hmm. by, by the Bank of England um, uh, through its uh, QE program. Mm -hmm. um, so um, how how that situation Um, I think, I mean, the, the only country where I've spent any time looking at central banks is Angola. And when I was there in 2017, um, it was a matter of where the political winds were. And the previous administration in the central bank had been a bunch of kleptocrats, and they had basically just been facilitators of large amounts of money flowing out of the country. Um, I mean, that was too crude, obviously. There was, you know, they, they, they often have very good technical people, but they are, you know, whoever's put in charge will dictate. And then there was a change, you know, the President Dos Santos um, left power just about when I was there and a new guy came in, 
um, Joao Lorenzo, and he was a different kind of character, and he put different people in the central bank. And the stories I heard then were that things had become better. But again, it's a function of, of politics. It's not like a central bank is a magic. You know, it can be a lever for for stopping this stuff, but it's you know subservient to politics at the end. So okay. Yes. It just drives up the price of yep. um, the financial assets. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually do much to the real economy. That's the yes. I, I think that I, I tend to agree with that argument. I think central banks are basically, what quantitative easing is, is basically puffing new money into the economy, new, huge amounts of new money, trillions. And um, uh, that has, you know, the, the idea has been, well, if there's, go, if there's a downturn, we can, you know, we can put this money in and it'll make people richer. But what it's done is it's gone into, you know, expensive housing and pushed the price up of real estate and, and other assets. And, and equities and you know share prices have, have gone up because there's so much more kind of money around to buy stuff and the beneficiaries of that have generally been the wealthiest sections of the population who are the largest owners of these assets so yes I would say there's a big problem there but they're terrified of taking away the punch bowl because um, you know they're worried it's going to cause some sort of house price crash and all sorts of other calamities so there's a sort of yes you're right to point that one out. Okay. Okay, I think I'm probably at the end here. Thank you very much, Nick. I just wanted to say a few words about Brave New Europe. It's a website which was sort of dedicated to an economic literacy campaign that people who have nothing to do with economics can understand what's occurring. And it's not that difficult, that's the amazing thing. Once you get into it a bit, it, uh, it starts falling together into a very simple uh, system to understand, at least to analyze, to find the answers to something completely different. It's a bit frightening initially because you're suddenly confronted with terms you've never heard, the Laffer curve, uh, Swabian Hausfrau. Uh, Swabian Hausfrau. Okay. Well, every German knows that one. It's a famous speech from America. I think everyone in the audience or the Gini coefficient. But what happens is you look it up once, you look it up twice, and by the third time you remember what it is, and then you notice it really isn't all that important. It's just sort of something that's always added to, to prove a point. So we can only recommend go in. These are articles that are written for normal people, although it's a lot of academics, a lot of experts, but the lovely thing is they've all learned to write for people like us so that we can understand it better. There is a sort of movement of educating you know, the populace. Otherwise, all you're going to have is the, the discourse provided by mainstream politicians and corporate media. And what they love to do is make things as confusing as possible, that no one understands it and does exactly the opposite of what's in their interest. So we can only recommend take the time. You don't have to go in every day. There aren't that many articles. Have a look in, go back, and uh, you'll learn, I think, yeah, a lot of things you've even asked here are explained in the course of time. And it just keeps repeating itself. That's the important thing. And then you start picking up on this. And of course, as, um, the talks that are coming, they're all very, very good speakers who are used to speaking not to an academic uh, public, but to a, a normal citizen public. So please do come.